Hello, everyone. Welcome to the beautiful Pacific Northwest of the United States of America. It's great to be here in Kamaha. And um, uh, awesome to um, be here in the middle of a beautiful sunrise that's unfolding right outside my windows here. Um, thanks for letting me borrow the sun for a bit. I know Richard Campbell is over in conference room three, a few hundred kilometers north of me also um, experiencing that sunrise. Um, so um, I am Mads Torgerson, or Mads Torgerson, as we say in Denmark, and I'm the uh, lead designer on the C-sharp language at Microsoft. And um, today we're going to talk about language design, because that's what I know to talk about. So um, I have a few um, things queued up in my slides here that I will try to actually successfully click on. There we go. Um, this, um, uh, I want to talk about some of the, some of the features that are uh, probably more interesting or, or different than, uh, what people are used to. Um, uh, one that's, uh, just shipped a couple of months ago, um, one that is queued up for the next release and some thoughts for what's further into the future of, uh, C-sharp. Now I was in the, uh, the quiz at the NDC social last night and, um, I almost won it. And what bothers me is not the bottle of whiskey that I didn't win. It's the fact that I flunked the question about which programming language was named after a TV series. So to redeem myself, I've sprinkled in a few quotes from that franchise um, throughout that hopefully are uh, relevant to the topic. Um, so to start out with, um, let's talk about uh, nullable uh, reference types, which is a feature that shipped in uh, C Sharp 8 and has been out now for um, four or five months um, in release. So um, the, the sort of core issue that um, nullable reference types are there to help address is really the uh, elephant in the room of object-oriented programming for the past 50 years. Um, or at least one of them. There can be more than one elephant. Um, and that's that's the problem with null. So we've sort of all just accepted the fact that null is um, a valid value of any object type. So null is a person, null is a vehicle, null is an animal, null is, any, is anything you might want it to be. And of course, that, that causes problem. I have a tiny little program here and um, if I run it, um, then um, it, it's trivial what it does. I create a person, I get the length of their middle name using a helper function, and then I write that length out. And there's nothing, the compiler doesn't uh, complain, it doesn't uh, uh, give any cause for concern, but when I run the program, of course, um, you get one of the famous uh, Monty Python explosions, um, followed by, and now for something completely different. Um, so it's taking a little while because I'm presenting, so things take longer when you're presenting. Um, but um, uh, let's see, here you go. You get that beautiful red telling us that something is wrong. Um, we get the, um, um, and we get the thing in the debugger telling us that there was a null reference exception. The middle variable was null. Oh, because I don't actually have a middle name and I was trying to take the length of it. And now the program crashed. Um, so wouldn't it have been nice if the compiler could have warned me a little bit about something like that um, uh, happening in my code? And that's what uh, nullable reference types are about. So essentially, um, the idea with nullable reference types is that it's a whole big feature, uh, probably the crowning jewel of C sharp eight, that's all about making fewer things work. It's not a new thing that makes more things work, but it's a, it's a feature that will tell you when your program is probably, um, it's probably wrong in more places than it has previously. And so it's going to give you more, um, it's going to talk more smack at you and give you more warnings or errors. And so therefore it's a feature that you have to opt into. So let's go and have a look at that. So here's that person class that we were using. It looks very innocent again. And I used that uh, two argument constructor there to, to build one of them before. 
Um, but um, if we go and turn on the nullable um, reference types checking, we can oh, nullable enable the new directive in C sharp. Then it'll start telling you if something is is suspect is suspect with respect to nulls. And so you see, I get a warning on the present constructor here saying that middle name is uninitialized uh, and, um, and it's non nullable, so shouldn't be. It should be initialized, huh? Um, well, I can initialize it. Uh, middle name equals null. Ha! There, I've initialized it. And sure enough, the warning goes away, but now I get a different warning saying you can't assign null to a non-nullable reference type. So essentially, by turning on this feature, I've said that all the reference types in C sharp are now non-nullable, and we will warn you if you try to put a null into them or leave a null in them, as I did to start out with. And that is really the, that, that is the first half of trying to address the null problem. Um, essentially, just don't let you stick nulls on there, nulls anywhere, unless you explicitly ask for it. So how do you explicitly ask for it, you ask? Well, um, you can have a nullable reference types, which is the name of the feature. And um, uh, you can put the question mark syntax now on reference types. Um, we've had that on value types in C-sharp for years and years, but now reference type can also be nullable. And now we're declaring to the world that middle names can be null. And now we're allowed to put the null in there without uh, incident. But let's go and have a look at what happened in our program now. Now, because we declared middle name to be uh, a type string question mark, and now we grab it out here, the type inference um, um, infers here that the var is a string question mark and therefore we're not allowed to dot it. Um, so I'm getting protected here. So how can I, but how can I, how can I help? Um, how can I um, get around this warning? Well, um, the old fashioned way of doing that in C sharp would be to check for null first if middle equals null or as we say nowadays, you can say if middle is null um, then return zero, maybe. And now you can see the warning goes away on the, on the middle dot length down here because we do control flow analysis to see that um, if you get to this point in the code, then middle cannot be null because other, if it was, we would have branched out uh, already of the method here. So um, essentially um, the way that you deal with um, nullable reference types and avoid the warnings is just to do the null checking that you've done all along. And, um, and we're very smart about recognizing when you are, when you're doing various forms of null checking, we could also have said, we could have checked in a completely different way. We can say return middle question dot length. Well, that gives you a nullable int, it gives you null if the length was, um, if the middle was null, and otherwise it gives you the length, but now we can null coalesce it so that if it ho that whole thing is null, um, then return zero instead. And again, the warnings go away. Um, so that's the, uh, that's the essence of the uh, nullable reference types feature. So when you add something like that to an old language, um, there's bound to be um, these gray areas. We, um, we can't just, handle everything. Um, so we try to handle as much as possible, but there are some places where we just, uh, we don't want to warn because it's not a nice thing you could have done instead. Um, for instance, you create an array of strings, they're not going to warn you to saying that, um, oh, all these strings you created are null. So a few places where um, the fact that this is grafted onto an existing language and intended to be turned on on your existing code means that we made some trade-offs that it's not entirely safe. Um, but um, it'll get the vast majority of the places in your code where, um, where um, you might get these null reference exceptions. And it certainly helped us fix this one. Um, so this is, a, this is a point in the talk where I would encourage you, if you have questions on this, um, on this feature, um, put them in Slido. There should be a there should be a link um, next to where the stream is is uh, coming at you. Um, go into Slido and um, and ask your questions there, and I will wait for a suitable amount of time to see if they show up.
while we're waiting for them, um, while we're waiting for the uh, questions to come in, one thing that you might observe here is that this is actually sort of a little bit unsafe in a way, right? Um, it's not so bad here, but let's say that I didn't have this um, this uh, local variable here, this temporary variable for the middle name, but I was actually, oh, hang on. Um, uh, can I? Uh, uh, boom. Uh, it's not working. Here we are. Um, I can inline the temporary variable here. Um, and so uh, that's actually fine. But if, uh, but let's say that the middle name changes between, um, um, yeah, this is what I'm, let's see. Um, let's say that the middle name changes between the, um, uh, the assignment and the test. So let's say that I said, um, yeah, that's actually, this is where I want to inline the temporary variable. Sorry for the uh, confusion here. Let's say that I fix the warning like so. If p dot middle name um, is null, return zero. Um, now you see the warning goes away because the analysis assumes that the um, that p dot middle name stays the same between the test and the um, and the dotting here. That's not actually entirely. Um, reliable, right? There might be multiple threads or some other code might be changing the middle name of this object behind the scenes that the analysis of this method can't see. So we're making some optimistic assumptions that occasionally may be wrong. And um, that's again, part of finding the balance. Um, with more, uh, there are some features that are more um, safe by construction than others. And certainly, um, uh, ways in which you can not reference p dot middle name twice, but kind of grab it right away into a temporary variable that no one else has access to. Those are more safe by construction. Now we have a question on this one, which is, let's see, can I, um, how would you go about enabling this nullable check in a big old solution with many projects? Yes, so the way it's enabled is that uh, you can either enable it for the whole project um, with, a, with a project setting, um, which I hope that we can turn on by default in uh, new projects, um, starting maybe already as soon as .NET 5. And, um, but you can also, as you saw me do in the person class, um, and, the, and that's what I did in the, pro before I even started, I did that in the, uh, in the project with the, um, with the program in here, but, I hadn't turned it on for the project that has the class in it. Instead, I can you can turn it on per file with these directives, and you can even like turn it on for part of a file. Um, so I can take this nullable enable and I can put it down here. And now you can see that the I get a warning on the question mark because the feature is not turned on for the first half of the file. And you can turn it on and off, or it, there are various ways that you can uh, carve out the pieces that are current that the feature is currently applied to. And so one way of doing this is to use these mechanisms to gradually uh, introduce um, nullable reference types to your code base a bit at a time. Um, there, there may be some code bases that are, that are just um, uh, very well tested and you're not really worried about them having null problems in themselves, but there may be a library, they may be a library that um, other code bases rely on. And so you can also choose to offer nullable annotations, but not do the null checking inside of your own body if you, or your own code if you trust the code itself to be fine. So there's various ways that you can do gradual adoption. But it is, so it is a, a hump to get over to get existing code to, um, to be null annotated, null aware, if you will. And um, we try to provide these, um, these ways of, um, of managing that. What we are doing is we're rolling out Nullable across all the core libraries and we're encouraging people who offer uh, libraries from uh, that aren't from Microsoft to also do the same so that when you rely on other people's APIs or libraries, um, you will get those Nullable annotations in the signatures and, and you, can, you can get better feedback on how you use those um, libraries in your own code. 
Um, so um, once you, if you turn it on on a new project though, then it keeps you honest all the time. It becomes just one more piece of feedback that you get from the tooling. And so there it's kind of smooth. It's only when you're sort of going through the bulk update, if you choose to do so, that's a bit hard. What could be a reason not to enable this feature if you're able to use c -sharp in a new project? Um, there's really not a good reason. The feature is very non-obnoxious in new code. Um, the only reason I can think of to not use it in new code is if, um, if a, li a library you rely on heavily hasn't adopted it yet, um, you, you have the choice of either still using the feature, but then you might get more warnings when the next version of the library gets its nullable annotations. Um, or in that case, you might choose to wait until your dependencies about have adopted it before you do, so you don't get the churn. That's sort of the only reason I can think of. Um, so that should be sort of temporary in the next, within the next year or two, hopefully most of the world, most of the active code and active libraries out there are null aware. How would this help when not implicitly assigning null, but rather the value being derived from an expression that could return null, i.e. external library? Um, well, it, it helps because the type of those libraries will say whether the thing can be null or not. And we will defensively say, oh, that thing might be null. Um, then um, uh, we will warn if you, if you dereference it unsafely without checking first. Of course, if you rely on a library that hasn't been annotated yet, um, you won't get any warnings. And so it doesn't help you if you're relying on a library that hasn't been null annotated. That's, that's really where the boundary is. And again, we could have made sort of the safe choice here and said, well, if you use an old library that's not annotated, we're gonna warn you all over the place. Um, but that's probably very, that's not very conducive to adoption. And so we said instead that um, old code, non null aware code, essentially, where, where the feature hasn't been turned on, those libraries, they get a pass. They don't trigger any warnings in user code. Um, so um, it doesn't really help you there. Okay. Um, and then I think that was mostly it for the nullable reference types. And uh, we got through the questions. So I will go back to the slides. Um, and start the slide deck here again. Now for something completely different. Um, so turning away from what's already out there and um, heading into the, um, the future of C-sharp, one of the things that we have been looking at for a very, very long time, and we've sort of hinted, oh, we're almost there, or we've almost figured this out, is um, a feature that we affectionately call records or a set of features or a kind of feature idea, if you will. The idea is in C Sharp as a classic object oriented um, programming language, um, writing simple data types can be pretty uh, laborious because all the defaults sometimes are, are kind of poking the wrong way. And um, we, we want to find some ways to make this easier. Um, so it started out with, okay, we can, we can build a feature that lets you write a very abbreviated syntax and then it, it's opinionated and it sort of just generates all the right stuff for some value of that. But every time we've looked at it like that, it, that hasn't really panned out to be a very nice feature or it, it's one of those where as soon as you don't fit within the opinionatedness of that feature, um, you fall off a cliff and you have to write a whole bunch of code yourself. So what we've been searching for um, is a way to kind of, kind of like if you remember Link, uh, language integrated query in C-sharp 3 or you know about it, it, it wasn't really one feature so much as it was a set of features that kind of worked together to achieve um, um, a certain scenario, but also a valuable features in and of themselves. And we're trying to th think of records in the same way. And so I'll show you where our thinking is today with no promises that this is how it will ship um, in actual C-sharp nine, but we're hoping to, 
chip C sharp nine um, late this fall along with um, .NET 5 in November. And so we're hopefully converging on this. But there's still some open questions and you'll see some of those. So one of the things that, we, that we've tried to do intermittently um, for a while is to better support immutable data types as opposed to mutable. Um, so um, there are several ways in which if you want to write immutable data types, you're at a disadvantage in C-sharp. And we'll continue to, to deal with some of those and I'll show you that in a bit. We also want to better support what we call nominal creation or what we started calling nominal creation. And essentially think of it as using object initializers instead of or on top of constructors. Um, because it has a bunch of good properties and people use them a lot. Um, and uh, there are a few other things here, but we'll, we'll get to them uh, in a minute. But one of the big points here is that um, we want to have all these features work well with inheritance. And that turns out to be because inheritance is a key feature in C Sharp. And a records feature isn't really worth its salt in an object oriented programming language if it isn't robust across inheritance and, and, and have, if it doesn't have like good. Um, conceptual founding, even when you have inheritance hierarchies, things that derive from each other. So that's been one of the things that has been really important for us to work out before we um, before we go public with this feature. So let's let's dive in and have a look. Let's start out with um, nominal creation. So um, classically, this is a sort of as opposed to positional creation. So if, so classically, object-oriented programming languages um, like Java and so on. Um, they have constructor classes have constructors. There's a person class here. It has a constructor um, that takes the, the data that eventually be, becomes the properties. Um, so you have to write the constructor. You have to um, assign to the properties at least. C sharp you used to also manually write a backing field and um, and uh, and the logic to. Um, surface the backing field through the property. And now we at least have auto properties to deal with that. But it's still, you have to do this transformation work here. And then when you when you write the um, a derived class, it gets a little more annoying because you have to take the parameters for the base class as well as your, your additional state here and pass some of it up to the base class explicitly and then do the rest here. Now contrast that with um, how you would do it with object initializers, which we've been able to do in C-sharp um, since um, C-sharp 3. Um, you would just write a class like this, two properties, and uh, that's it. And the derived class um, derives and then has another property, and that's it. And now uh, the place where it gets a little more laborious is that instead of just passing values to a essentially a creation function, a constructor, well, you have to do it nominally by name instead of by position here um, so that you're, you're directly setting the properties as part of your um, construction uh, expression here. Instead of passing them into a function that then does something with them, that happens to always be the same thing pretty much. So um, clearly there's just some terseness benefits to the nominal uh, creation part, but there are also other benefits. Um, uh, from a software engineering perspective in particular, and if you think about these chunks of code, the base class, the derived class, the, the consuming client of the code, uh, think of them being independent, living in different um, projects, different assemblies, and, and evolving maybe to some degree independently. Um, there, are all kinds of, um, there are all kinds of strong dependencies in the, in the positional regime here where let's say I wanted to add another property to a person. Um, now I have to, um, I, I can't just add another parameter to the constructor because now I'm gonna break the derived class and I'm gonna break the, um, the construction here. Um, now I could, I could maybe add it with, a, with an optional parameter, but that's still binary breaking change. Or now I have to keep a constructor around that it's not really the one I'm supposed to use anymore just so that my other code doesn't break. So, so the, the whole independent update thing uh, becomes very gnarly because you have very strong dependencies between both at the source and the binary level between the different components here. And contrast that over here where really as long as the members that I'm talking about 
um, are still there, the code will still compile. So a lot of a lot of people I talk to, they use um, they mandate uh, this nominal approach to to class libraries and say we we don't we're not going to do the constructor based thing at all, even though that sort of is the official way in the language, so to speak, for the, because of these software engineering benefits. Now, of course, the big downside is that it works by actually assigning to the um, properties as part of the, uh, or after the object has been created. So under the hood, it creates a student and assigns into these properties, which means that they have to be mutable. And so if you want to have immutable data representations, which you often do when you're just simple, representing data simply or have a, an immutable uh, data model like the um, syntax trees in a Rosling compiler for C-sharp, for instance, are immutable. And, many things nowadays are, are done with immutable models. Well, um, having to make your object model mutable just so that you can use object initializes, that seems like it's, um, it's a serious disadvantage. And so one of the features we're looking at is what we're calling init only properties. And that's, the idea is that you can create a version of the, the property setter that only works during initialization time. And so we're, we're creating essentially this concept of initialization time, which is um, which stretches beyond the actual constructor call and also includes the stuff that's in the object initializer here. Um, so, so these properties are assignable until the until the object initializer stops, and then no longer. So now you're sort of regaining immutability while being able to use nominal object creation. That's one feature. Um, now, one thing you lose with nominal um, uh, object creation is this ability to do whole object validation and other initialization logic that kind of depends on having all the data available to some logic that says, oh, this object can't be created because this is that, or that does some um, last minute initialization or something. Um, so, um, in a positional regime, you would put some logic in the constructor here and say, okay, um, I'm going to check that the, you know, the, the length of this name, um, all told, isn't, isn't too great. Otherwise, I'll throw an exception. Whereas for uh, the, the, the nominal stuff, there re isn't really a place to put this check because by the time the constructor runs, um, you haven't assigned the first name and the last name yet. That is yet to come. That, that, is yet, that happens during the um, execution of the initializers. Um, so we're thinking of this idea, we have called them validators, but they should probably be called initializers or something, but many things are already called initializers. So we'll think of a good name for them. But um, the idea is that it's something like a constructor, but it doesn't take any parameters. Uh, it doesn't have any accessibility defined or anything. It's just a chunk of code that a class can declare that gets run after initialization. So it's the last stuff that gets run. Um, so here it would get run after the object initializers had already been assigned and it can now examine the, um, uh, well, these should be uppercase later, first name and last name, that's a bug in my slide there. Um, but you can now examine the state of the object and decide whether this is a good object to share with the world before it gets assigned and sort of has this last chance of throwing an exception just before this object has been uh, completed and gets assigned to P and shared with the world and, and consumed. So it's sort of a last chance to get in a, um, a, a check or some other initializer logic here. So, um, so that's another way in which we're trying to make nominal creation more full-fledged. Um, one thing that we haven't gotten so far at looking at yet is um, no one's forcing you to assign these properties that are declared here. Whereas with the positional, um, if, you are, if your constructor's parameters aren't optional, then you are forced to pass something in. And sometimes you want that, you want something to be mandatory. And um, we're still looking at what's the, what's the right feature for letting properties be mandatory, have mandatory initialization. Um, so it's work in progress. Now, those things aren't about records, um, but we'll, 
uh, as a separate feature yet. They're just like useful features in C-sharp. And here's one more that might be moderately useful in and of itself, but we're sort of starting to gather up a set of building blocks for um, having a dedicated records feature. Again, just like link, there are all these building blocks, lambdas and expression trees and so on. And then there's the actual career expression feature that brings them all together. Um, now, um, one thing that, that is frequently annoying to people is that you can only really create objects with constructors. But if you wanna apply an object initializer, um, like down here, you can only apply it in a new expression. You can't have like a call like a factory method and then apply an object initializer. So it's hard for a class to offer a more abstracted view of its object creation um, options really. Now, let's say that we had some way of naming something at factory. Um, then we, we could allow you to apply object initializers to the result of a factory. And the factory in turn would have to promise that it would only return new objects and we could check that. So assume that we have that feature. Let me try to, to, to do one, uh, one thing that you could do if you had that. So let's add to the person class. Let's give it a, a protected, essentially a copy constructor, a constructor that um, um, takes an existing person and copies its state over to, a new, to this new person, okay? Um, it's protected, so it's only meant to be called from inside the class itself. And now we put a public um, virtual method um, out there in the surface area of the person called with, it takes no parameters, and all it does is it creates a new copy of this person um, and returns it. And this we can, whether it's an, um, an attribute or an actual keyword, we can discuss. Uh, syntax is always up for discussion, but because it's marked a factory method, it, it, it satisfies that criterion because it is returning a new object and compiler can check this. Um, and we can do the same kind of thing in, in student and it can override the with method and return a student instead of a person. And actually maybe we can add um, uh, covariant return types to C-sharp as well. And we're working on doing that properly in the runtime. As a, as a separate feature again, so that you can have a more specific return type when you override a method than the one that, that was in the, the original declaration. So now we're overriding with to actually return a student instead of a person, so that the with method essentially gives you a copy of what the object actually was, not a copy at the sort of static, uh, statically known type. Okay, what's with this with method? Well, if I had that and it's a factory method, then I could do this. I could call the with method, get a copy back of P1, but because I'm calling a factory method, I get to apply an object initializer to it. And so I can create a modified copy. For instance, when I got married, I changed my last name. So I used to be called Nilsson, but then I got married and now I'm called Torgerson. So we're creating a new record of me that's like the old one, but with something changed that is non-destructive mutation, which is a key um, uh, element in working with, um, with immutable uh, data. And so this is uh, using these, this, this combination of elements, I can now have an immutable um, object that uh, where I can create, um, where I can do non-destructive mutation. And, you know, maybe like with the uh, current object initializers, maybe we allow you to omit the arguments for niceness when, when the argument list is empty, or um, what we're currently planning, there's a, there's a keyword that, that's syntactic sugar for doing what you just saw. Um, that's a with expression that is designed for this very purpose for non-destructive mutation. Um, so now these building blocks, let's go and talk about what a record, what a record feature could be. So let's imagine that this is extra keyword that you can put on a class of struct declaration. Um, you say that it's a record and you declare some properties and it has inheritance like everything else. Um, but the record keyword means that there are some things you get. Well, first of all, even without the record keyword, we get nominal creation because we have this, um, um, in it only property feature. But on top of that, the record 
keyword automatically generates that with stuff that was a little gnarly in the example before. So when you put record on, it will it will just put the right thing into the class to support uh, an undestructive mutation so that you can whiff these uh, records here. Um, also, we didn't talk about that as a separate, a separate feature, um, but you could get value equality. Um, so let's say very hypothetically that I got divorced um, or just changed my mind about my last name. Um, you know, there would be another non-destructive mutation here. Um, and um, we value equality would then mean that even though P3 references a different object with different object identity than the original P1, then uh, comparing them equal uh, with various equals mechanisms would still make them the same because they contain the same values. Value equality is also really useful when you're just talking about plain old data. It's a little dangerous when you have objects that are mutable, but value equality and immutable go really well together. And so we would also support value equality out of the gate on records. Um, getting Implementing value equality is um, yourself is really tedious. Um, and it's also error prone. And especially when you have inheritance in the mix, um, it's actually really hard to, to create, or it's hard to get it right, um, to create um, an equality implementation that is symmetric, even when there's inheritance involved. You tend to um, accidentally compare things using the left-hand side's equality uh, in some cases and the right-hand side's equality in other cases. Um, or rather, if you swap them, you get different equality supply. But we have a trick for that. And so um, we, we, we know a good way to implement value equality across um, inheritance. So we've been debating whether value equality should be something that you can independently opt into on a class or whether it should just be something we do when you, when you go full in and say, I'm, I want my class to be a record class. We haven't, we, we, our current plan of record is, uh, plan of record is to, um, to just have value quality generated for records because we think records are broad and useful enough that, that it's fine that when you want value quality, you probably want the other stuff as well. Um, we may be wrong on that. And we're designing value quality in such a way that it's easily separable as a feature if we decide that that's the right thing, even later, even in a subsequent release. Now, um, there are other things to think about for records. Now, the, the, the record syntax that we have here is pretty terse in that you only have to state the properties and the rest gets figured out for you. But of course, people can't get enough of terseness, right? And so you, um, um, you might wonder whether there are some abbreviations that you can do when you have a record. Maybe, you know, maybe things are public by default. And so whenever you declare your properties, they're public by default because after all, a record is really about the data and you wouldn't normally um, or the having things private would sort of not be the best default. Maybe most records wouldn't have any private stuff and only very advanced ones would. And so maybe just changing the default would be good. Or maybe you want to go even, even further and say that if you declare something that just looks like a, what would be a private field in normal class, maybe that actually defaults to generating a public uh, in it only property of that name. Um, so that things are so terse that you can you can just write your types as one-liners. And now um, it's almost like being in a functional language, but with beautiful inheritance, you, you get these very terse data declarations. So where to where to um, set the dial on this abbreviation stuff is something that we're also it's an active debate, um, and um, we're still figuring it out. And again, it's something that if we don't do it. Um, up front, it's still going to be really useful, and we can add it later by public demand. So, um, so that's up for the suffer debate. Now, um, you you might also want to mix constructors and records, and it might be nice if you could declare a record with sort of a constructor declared directly on the class name, and just have these things turn into properties to in it only properties on the person class, as well as there being a, a constructor generated. Um, for taking in those. Um, we could even declare a deconstructor for you as well um, if you have a constructor. Um, of course, 
it has now we're back to some of the same problems with with uh, positional creation that you now have to repeat yourself in a drive class and so on. But um, so this might be something that you would mostly do if you don't also have inheritance in the mix, but it's certainly on the table. So um, that was it for records. And I'm going to go over and see if there are some, there's a question here. And while I'm look, while I'm answering that, maybe more questions uh, will come in. Will the nominal initializer still cover up the code line if an error occurs? Say you use a method to set a property. That is the main reason I don't use them. Hmm. Um, cover up the code line. Um, oh, in, in, I mean, in the sense of a in the sense of tooling that you don't get the um, um, the the place where the error occurs. Um, call out as specifically. Um, there's certainly, if I'm understanding you correctly, for instance, in the debugger, there are places where you can't really, the sub statement places where the debugger can't really like step to, and you can't really get the feedback at that level. Maybe when we've talked about whether we should improve the tooling here. So I think maybe that is a, um, if that was a question, maybe that is something that we could, could handle in tooling. Um, just gonna wait. Another second to see if there are more questions on the records. There was a nullable question that I missed. Um, maybe it came in after um, I, I changed topics, um, which I can I can come back to. It says, can moving to nullable references be automated somehow, at least for most cases? Um, that's a really good question. I think to some degree it probably can. We, we experimented with some tools and we did try to use them um, on the, um, on the uh, core library, on our core libraries. Um, and I'm not sure what the state of them are. They're certainly hacky, <laughs> but they're probably things you could do to kind of do a broad sweep and then um, get most of it right. Put nullability in accordingly. So that is that is certainly an option. The, the danger of that is that you, if you have any wrong behavior in there, you might end up encoding that in the in the signature rather than discovering it and fixing it. So there are trade-offs there. Okay. Um, I am not seeing more questions in Slido right now. Um, so let's move to the third topic which is um, uh, not something that we're actively working on right now, but that we've been debating also for years. And it's one of those things that would be a really big change to C Sharp that would, or addition to C Sharp that would involve the runtime and various things. It's something that needs a lot of, needs a lot of working through, making sure we get it right. But I think it's very exciting. If there are people out there who are, acquainted with certain functional languages, um, maybe one of the ways of looking at it is it's sort of an attempt to add the equivalent to what Haskell calls type classes to C sharp. Um, but um, I'm not gonna explain it from that angle because most of you are probably not Haskell programmers and so that's not gonna be very um, enlightening. But um, uh, the, the idea is to add a triple of features to some version of C-sharp, which I will call 10. Um, but that does not entail any sort of promise or decision. Um, and, and those would help, uh, especially, but not exclusively with generic abstraction. So um, the first feature is static interface members. So interfaces today and in most object-oriented languages can only specify um, instance members for the implementing classes. Roles is an idea of allowing an existing value, like an existing object, um, viewing it from a certain angle and giving it that it might imbue it with additional members um, and also even additional types without um, messing with what, how it's represented at runtime, like without wrapping it or anything. And extensions are sort of a type level version of that, like extension methods, but allowing 
not just methods, but other things to uh, apply to a given type in a given scope in addition to what the type already has. And they're all kind of tied together in various ways. And I have an example that I'll go through that showcases all of them. Um, it's a little contrived, but on the other hand, um, it addresses a, a common need that in, in uh, .NET code that is not well handled today. So, um, um, so in that sense, it shows some of what these features will be able to do. Okay. So starting out with an interface here, um, one of the things that we really struggle with is numeric abstraction in .NET. Because numerics is done through, um, it's typically done primarily with static members in particular operators. Um, it's really hard to abstract generically um, algorithms that work on types that have certain numeric capabilities. But if we had static members and interfaces, we could describe um, um, we could describe numeric entities more abstractly with interfaces like this. Um, so um, this is a, a mathematical object called a monoid, and we're representing it with an interface. And a monoid is something that has um, a neutral element, which we'll call zero, and it has an operator, which applies to uh, monoids and produces to, to the particular kind of monoid and produces other uh, objects of that particular kind of monoid. And of course, the zero one is then expected to be neutral under under the what we call the addition, the operator here. And so based on just these two operations, we could we could write ourselves a generic method that takes anything that's a monoid, um, takes an array of those, um, and starts out with the, the neutral element and then for each is over the array and adds the, um, the additional elements, whatever they are, to that, um, accumulating it and then returning the result. Of course, this is a very, this is a trivial numeric algorithm, but um, imagine bigger numeric algorithms and imagine bigger types representing their capabilities. Um, now, we, we get um, a way of writing a beautiful uh, generic code um, abstracted over numeric capabilities. So I think, so static members in and of themselves are, are pretty useful. And now we would go and implement iMonoid on say the ordinary int in, uh, in .NET, and we would add either an implicit or explicit implementation of the zero, and we would sort of just let the plus of int implement the plus operator expected by the iMonoid interface. And, um, and now we would be able to call this generic add all method with an int array and infer the, the uh, type argument to be int. And it would satisfy the constraint that it, in, it is indeed an iMonoid of int. So that kind of all clicks together as a, as a story in and of itself. And it's really nice. And so we should just have, um, Static members and interfaces. And in fact, several years ago, we did an experiment of how to implement that in the runtime, and that turned out exceedingly well. Except back then, we weren't eager to put new language features in the runtime because the .NET runtime shipped as part of Windows, and up updating it was a nightmare that we didn't want to embark on. But now with .NET Core, we can. So let's go and embrace that. However, there are also some problems with this scenario, and I'm going to exaggerate them a bit just to uh, sufficiently motivate the other features. Um, but, but let's have a look at it. One problem is that you can imagine many, many different um, sets of operators being, um, being embodied in interfaces. And putting all of them on int would be like, you, you, can, you would have groups and rings and all kinds of mathematical objects, plus more that you could come up with yourself. and we would have to put all those in int and it would sort of have too many interfaces for it to be reasonable. It'd be hard to predict which one we should put on there. Um, another problem is that there's more than one way that int could actually implement this interface. Like the natural, the obvious one is with, uh, with int zero and with the int plus operator, but, int, but integers are actually a monoid over multiplication as well with the neutral element being one and the, um, and the 
operator being multiplication. And so we could equally well, um, not equally well, because that's more contrived, but we could imagine a perfectly valid implementation of imonoid on ints that um, uses uh, one and multiplication as, as the, um, the implementation. So how do we choose in this case? It's probably obvious, but um, some case, you can imagine cases where it's not so obvious. Third problem is, you know, I might want int to implement I'm on out of T, but I might not have access to go and, and muck with a core library here. I can't go and slap interfaces on it. So it would kind of have to funnel through some like central acceptance process. Oh yes, this is a good interface. Let's put it in the core library and have int implement it. Um, so it's kind of like, um, I don't get to muck with that as, as a numeric programmer who wants to use wants to abstract, do something abstractly over uh, numer certain uh, numeric types. Um, so that's more like a software engineering challenge as well. So let's try to solve that. Um, and the idea is to have something called a role. And I'm not going to quibble about syntax. This is definitely a straw man syntax. This, if we ever do it, it will not look like this. But a role is a new kind of type declaration. It declares a new kind of thing which can enhance other types with additional behavior. So I'm going to declare a role that enhances int with the um, neutral element zero, this, that static property. Okay. And now that means that I can, uh, so there's int add monoid, which has a zero. Um, but it, the role is something that is, it's a type that I can apply to ints. So, um, and it's not representation changing. So I can actually take a whole array of ints and I can just cast it to this int add monoid type because it's a role on int. And that doesn't, you know, create a new array and copy things over anything. It's really just a reference assignment. It's just another view, type view that I have on the same values. That's what a role means. And, but because I'm doing that, I can now um, view my int values as, um, as int add monoids. If it added any instance members, I could loop over the, this array here and I could do things to my values that int add monoid added to them that weren't inherent to int. But roles could even implement interfaces. So it could implement the i monoid interface for int and say that when you view ints as this role, then they implement this interface. Now, and again, it just, just like the implementation of the interface before, it works the same way. It checks to see, okay, does int have all the operations? Well, it has the plus, but we need to specify the zero as well. And now it does have all the operations to implement the interface. So when viewed as an int add monoid, an int is a monoid. And this is how. The, the role specifies that that's the case and how it's the case by giving the implementations here. And now the interesting thing is that because of that, once I view my int array as an array of int add monoids, I can pass that to add all and the role becomes the type argument. And the type argument is therefore something that satisfies the constraint that has a plus and a zero and the uh, generic method will run. So essentially what I've built is an adapter for ints for them to fit into my generic abstraction. An adapter that does, that does not adapt them at runtime by changing their um, representation, but just adapts them to the type system, if you will. Um, so, so that's what roles can do. They can adapt individual values or like arrays of values here um, so that they fit uh, certain shapes or certain types. Um, now, um, one of the things that you can do with that, because I'm choosing which role to apply here, is that I could implement that other that could use, implement that other implementation of monoids on int using a different role. So I have an int mol monoid here, maybe there should be better naming conventions for these. And, um, 
And that also implements I'm on a bint, but in a different way, it gives that those the, the multiplication based implementation. And now both can coexist and be part of my toolbox, so to speak. And then when I choose to pass my int array to add all, I can I specify with the um, with the type parameter or the type argument which which role I want to apply, like how my ints are going to play the role of I monoid um, gets to be specified there. So I can I can do one with int mol monoid instead here, call the same method with the same array, pass a different role, and get a different result. Now, sometimes that's what you want. Sometimes you want to be able to view individual values um, through a certain lens. And sometimes what you want is just to extend, in a, in a certain part of your program, you want to extend a given type with extra capabilities. And that's what we've had extension methods for for um, many years now. The problem with extension methods is that they're sort of like an evolutionary dead end in that based on how, how they're done, you can't really have extension properties and extension much else. And so this is sort of an attempt to back off that particular uh, design, but use the general concept and introduce a more, um, a more generalized version of the feature that we call extensions. And what an extension is, is it's like a role. It specifies an enhancement of a given type, but it, but it causes that enhancement to apply to all values of that type implicitly, just like an extension method applies to all values of the type that it enhances. So it's just a generalization of the extension method concept. So now all ints are int monoids in the scope of this declaration, wherever this de declaration has been put into effect, like has been using or whatever. And so now I can get the zero off of int monoid, but I can also get it off of int because all ints are now int monoids and therefore have the zero static property. Um, and again, because this is just essentially a role defined for all ints, um, I can implement interfaces with it. And now all ints, uh, in, as long as this declaration is in force, so to speak, all ints um, are now monoids and can be passed to add all here. So this would allow essentially the full generalization of extension methods, not just to extension all other kinds of members, but also to extension interfaces, to extend with implementation of, of extra interfaces. And, um, and that's it. Um, so we have time for a few more questions. Um, and I see that there are a few. Um, let's see. Um, which use cases do you use for static interfaces? Where do you see it being used? Um, I think that um, numeric abstraction is one. Another thing is if you want to abstract over construction, uh, how, the, how this kind of object can be constructed, um, a, a constructor is essentially a static member. Um, so you could, um, the interface could specify that certain constructors are present or factory methods or things like that. Um, that would be another big scenario for it. Um, let's see. There was a, um, a question for the previous topic. I imagine for some classes, I would want to have both mutable and immutable instances. Why not have them specified at create instead, e.g. new person as record? Uh, that's an interesting idea. That's sort of the idea that a given class can specify both Sometimes you, you do that, you have that pattern where you can mutate things for a while and then you freeze them. And the only way you can implement that today is to have a bit inside of an object saying I'm freezed and then start throwing on all the mutation stuff. And maybe you could build that kind of thing into the type system as well. We haven't thought of that, um, but uh, that might be an avenue of thinking. I haven't, I haven't thought of it much, but yeah, good idea. Um, any more questions? Also on the, are you just completely, you just, now you just want to get beer in whatever time zone you're in. Um, let's see. I think we have 30 seconds left of the talk. Um, 
I don't see more things coming in. Even with the lag, we should conclude that you guys are you guys are ready for the end of the day. So I want to say thank you very much for listening to my crazy ramblings, and um, you know keep using C Sharp and keep getting us the good ideas and the bad ones and everything in between so we can keep evolving it as a great language. Thank you very much. <laughs>